Okay, this is Matt Paulson again. I'm looking at a video by Dr. Ali Ate, and he's going to talk about the Hebrew and the translation at the time of Muhammad in the seventh century. And this is kind of interesting because it talks. He talks about the Old Testament and New Testament, and how it might differ today. Let's hear what he has to say. The bottom line is the Hebrew Bible that was. Uh, existence in 7th century Arabia is basically the same as the Hebrew Bible used today in the ayah in question that the Prophet ﷺ is maktuban that the Prophet ﷺ is described in the Torah and the Gospel that is with them in the 7th century and there have been no major evidences of some sort of major redaction that was done to the Tanakh after that point. The differences between the textual traditions of Ben Asher and Ben Chayim are very, very minor. Okay, what are the missions? So, we're looking at the Hebrew Bible today versus what was there in the 7th century during the time of Muhammad. And now, there's no corruption. How can you uh, attack the Bible if you're saying that the Bible that we had in the 7th century is basically the same as the one today? Let's hear what he has to say more. Now, there are several Muslim scholars who did not confirm that the Bible had been, the text, of the, the text of the Bible had been altered at all, at least not in a significant way. Rather, the meanings of the texts, right, had been altered or corrupted or concealed or ignored. This is called tahriful ma'ani, exegetical or interpretive alteration or corruption. This, okay, so what he's going to infer is that for 500 years, they didn't know that the prophecies of the Old Testament of the Messiah, of Jesus to come, was fulfilled in the New Testament. Uh, Deuteronomy 18.18 18 and others uh, are not about Jesus, but they were actually about Muhammad, who came 500 years after Jesus. Uh, it's quite a step, uh, but that's what they have to do if Muslims are going to say, that uh, the Bible is not corrupted, that the meanings are corrupted, the interpretations are corrupted, then you're stuck with a Bible that is basically what we see today. Seems to be the position of Imam al-Razi himself, and perhaps even the position of uh, Imam Ghazali. This, what I call textually affirming approach to the Bible, is no better exemplified by the great Damascene scholar, Imam Ibrahim ibn Umar al biqai who died 1480, who used the Torah as a primary source of exegesis of the Qur'an, which is called an nazm al-Durar. And he even did a, uh, an Arabic diatessaron, as a harmony of the four canonical gospels of the New Testament. So Imam al-Biqa'i, in his tafsir of Surah al-A'raf 157, will actually quote specific pesukhim, or ayat, of the Tanakh that he believes are references to the Prophet ﷺ. For example, and we'll talk about this one, Deuteronomy 18.18, 18. he quotes Deuteronomy 33.2, Psalm 1.18, and even goes into some New Testament passages, the Paraclete passages of John 14 and 16, he believes to be references to the Prophet ﷺ. So for these ulama, for these ulama, the Qur'an does not argue that the text of the Bible was rewritten or replaced with false scripture, but rather that the text has been ignored or forgotten. <laughs> okay, so John 16, 7 says Jesus is going to go send the comforter to the disciples. So uh, that's the immediate context. But I guess uh, the Muslim scholars would say that, oh, no, no, that's not about uh, the Holy Spirit coming at Pentecost. That's about Muhammad coming 500 years later. That's quite a stretch. I just, and then why is, how is Jesus sending uh, the Holy Spirit or the Comforter? He's not sending Muhammad. Uh, that would really make him God because in the Quran it says that Muhammad was sent by Allah to be a mercy to the world. Quite a step, quite a step. Ten, or concealed, or misinterpreted. So, another translation. According to Gabriel Said Reynolds at Notre Dame, 
from the Jews are those who shifted the meanings of words from their proper contexts. In other words, they misread the text, not altered the text. Now, the point of tonight's lecture is not to examine both Muslim approaches to the Bible, whether it's textual alteration or textual uh, affirmation, and to make a case one way or another. That's a lecture for another time. The point I'm making now is that if we're going to find the Prophet ﷺ in the Bible, let us for now entertain Imam al-Biqa'i and assume that the text of the Bible is sound. With this said, a cursory skim of the Bible will not do. We need to look closer. We need to be more sophisticated. <laughs> okay, if he's going to be sophisticated, that means you're going to believe the Torah is true, which means that uh, Isaac is in the test of Abraham, that uh, Isaiah 53 is about a suffering servant that happens in the first century, that Psalms uh, 22, 16, where King David says he felt like his hands and his feet are pierced, has nothing to do with Jesus. That's quite a step to say it's somebody else. It's not, it's not Jesus. Uh, that's incredible. So uh, for him to say that is a good uh, foundation for Christians and evangelicals to believe the Bible is true, that Islam is not true because it violates so much of the Bible that we can believe the Bible over what somebody's opinion about what uh, interpretations might be uh, in the eyes of a Muslim scholar or Islamic doctrine. You don't read in, uh, to the interpretation with a pretext with having our presuppositions already fixed in our minds and we read the scriptures, how, how do we deal with that? How can we look at the New Testament which very distinctly says Jesus died on the cross? How are you going to read that and still keep your John uh, 14 and John 16 prophecies of Messiah, uh, of Muhammad to come? That's very difficult to understand. So I just pray that this guy would someday see the light that uh, Jesus would open up his mind, that somehow Christ would enlighten his heart, take out that heart of stone, put it in the heart of flesh, and he'll get, get saved. In Jesus' name, amen.